I don't know, Bob, you got interest rates moving higher again, 10-year treasury up to close to 4.4% oil now, up to around $85 a barrel. Is it like the 70s all over again? Or are we just going right back into a big inflationary, you know, kind of uh, move up here? What's going on, Bob? Well, you know, first of all, we got a very strong economy. Um, it's official, Rye. There was no recession in 2022, 2023. No hard landing. Um, matter of fact, you know, this economy never landed. So I don't, you know, they keep using this, you know, this definition of a hard landing, soft landing. Well, how about an economy that just keeps going up? That's that's not a landing. It didn't have to land, right? still flying. Well, I mean, it seems like it's flying high now, too. I mean, if you start looking at estimates for growth in the first quarter at close to 3%, I mean, that's that's a pretty robust economy. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why interest rates are starting to go back up is because, you know, there's one thing that's correlated is higher growth, higher economic growth and higher interest rates, right? They, they kind of go hand in hand, um, which speaks to what we talked about a lot. It's just like the Fed probably shouldn't cut interest rates too quickly here. Um, but you know, by the sounds of our, our Fed chairman, Jay Powell, we'll just have to see, you know, he sounded like he was ready to cut rates a, a lot uh, a couple of weeks ago. It sounds like, um, he wants to keep his job in an election year. I, I don't know. I mean, you know, call me cynical, <laughs> but <laughs> you know, there absolutely, there, there's absolutely no reason for him to, to move on, on rates. I mean, we have consumers doing what they always do. They're consuming at an incredible rate. Right, capital spending is at an all-time record high, three point three trillion at the end of last year. Right? Yeah, it's crazy. Um, you know, there's a lot of money being spent, and, and the government running a two trillion dollar deficit is adding a little bit of uh, fire to this economy as well. And if you just start looking at the fundamental numbers, right? I mean, margins are going up for companies. Uh, we look at earnings estimates out to the future that are record high right now. Mm-hmm. And if you look at dividends and stock buybacks, we're gonna have a record this year. So that's a lot of money being returned to shareholders. So you have a lot of things going right. I mean, we talk about Goldilocks a lot, but man, oh man, like talk about everything kind of lining up right now if you're an investor. It probably doesn't get much better than this. Uh, The only thing that concerns me is everyone else is starting to feel good. I always like it when we feel really good and everyone else feels really, really bad. But when everyone starts to feel the same way that we do, that's that's a problem, right? I don't want to be on the same side as everybody else. Yeah, I know the sentiment readings have gotten very, very bullish. I mean, even the permit bearers were bullish in the short run, uh, which is probably why we're due for a little correction. But it's just um, just amazing how sentiment swings so rapidly. And it's all based on, are the prices up or down? It's like, it's kind of like, you know, when you go out to dinner with someone and they, they, they look on the right side of the menu, you know, to look at what wine you're going to order, as opposed to the left side, you know, picking a good wine. They just base everything on price. Yeah. Hey, they're charging a lot. It must be really good. I assume, Bob, that's the way you always pick wine in the restaurant, you know? I've, I've, I've had to pick up the tab a couple times. Um, but it is interesting. I mean, you're definitely starting to see some rotation. You know, one thing we've been talking about a lot is that max diversification. And, you know, oddly with interest rates going up, or not oddly, but you've had a lot of what's been winning this year. Technology has been selling off a little bit this week. Yet other areas like energy, materials, uh, commodity-based companies, all of that starting to do really, really well, especially with oil prices going up. So you always have a lot of things that ying when other things yang, and you have the emerging markets starting to move here too, but you want to be there ahead of time. So you want to allocate your assets in a way where, you know, assuming that things are going to change in the future. And again, what we're seeing is a lot of you out there still have your portfolio all looking the same, just overweighting the overweight of what's working, and that becomes a problem when it stops working. That makes sense. Well, it makes a lot of sense. And, you you know, it's like music to my ears. Uh, you're talking about investments that, you know, like pipelines uh, and energy, they yield over 5%. You have real estate that yields over 4%. Uh, international blue chip stocks yield over 3.5%. Large cap value stocks yield over 2.5%. So you're, you know, you're, you're getting paid to wait. You know, when I had that uh, third quarter last year, that 10% correction where everybody's hair was on fire, you know, our clients were collecting their interest that are dividends while they're waiting for the, you know, the big booming bull market to to uh, start up again, uh, which it did over the last six months. So it's, you know, it, it, it sounds great when you have, you know, something that's up 200 percent and, uh, you know, something you brag about at a cocktail party. But I'll tell you what, you know, slow and steady, um, you know, getting rich and wealthier slowly is the way to go as far as I'm concerned. Well, it's a good point because it is an anomaly when you have these big moves up in growth stocks. It only happens once in a while. And in fact, if you look at it historically, 40% of your return comes from dividends. 
mm-hmm. which we know a lot of these hot stocks today don't pay very much in dividends at all. Um, and what happens is investors bid up growth stocks, which tend to be better companies, actually, because they grow faster. Uh, they're more efficient. But what we tend to do is we tend to bid them up too much in the short term. And value stocks, which tend to trade cheaper, they grow a lot slower, a lot more boring. Um, we tend to actually we actually tend to price them too low. So over time, value stocks actually end up outperforming growth stocks. But you get these weird anomalies, like times like now in the late '90s, where growth rapidly outperforms technology stocks rapidly outperform. Um, but that doesn't typically last. And when the party stops, they get hit so hard that their longer term returns end up being a lot less than those boring companies uh, that pay dividends that trade at lower, lower valuations. And most investors don't realize that. And it's very deceiving right now. Well, if you watch the financial news channels, all you hear about is tech, right? They, they talk about the Magnificent Seven ad nauseum. Um, you know, you ever hear any mention of infrastructure companies, right? You know, small and mid cap capitalization infrastructure stocks are blowing the doors off of technology in terms of performance. Not, not just this year, but over the last two or three years, right? I mean, everybody knows that we're you know, we're getting out of China, we're we're onshoring, we're nearshoring. Well, that you know that takes a lot of building, a lot of investment. I mean, it's one of the reasons why capital spending is so high, um, and you know, and it's going to continue because you know we just had you know record cash flows, you know, for these companies. That's why we're getting stock buybacks and we're getting dividends of one point nine trillion dollars because companies are generating an enormous amount of cash and they're investing it in their own corporate infrastructure, and the government's going to be investing a ton of money in the infrastructure in this country. Yeah, and I'll put one caveat there on CNBC. Not only do they talk about the Magnificent Seven, but they love to talk about Disney stock. It's their favorite stock to talk about. I don't know why, but they talk about it all the time. And Uh, You're the only name I haven't heard has been bandied out uh, for for the new CEO. I mean, I've heard so many other names. (laughs) Pretty soon they'll be nominating you, right? It would be a bad decision. Uh, That's true, but, but hey, why not? Put me on the ballot. But no, it's you know it's a great point. If you look at it right now, our material stocks are, are at an all-time record high. Healthcare stocks are at their all-time record high. Consumer staple stocks. So there's, there are a lot of other sectors working right now. Mm-hmm. They're just not going up at the same magnitude as semiconductor stocks uh, like NVIDIA, like super microcomputer that you hear about every day. Um, but it's so important, especially, I mean, you, we have a lot of baby boomers that are clients. They need cash flow. And ironically, right now, you know, money's not going to where there's high cash flow. You just mentioned real estate investment trusts, where the valuations are cheap, cash flow is high, and long for long term projections are very good. Um, yet most of us aren't allocated that way, and it's just such a big misallocation of capital. We saw this in the late '90s. You know, everybody overweight at the overweight. They owned a technology fund. On top of that, they owned at Cisco. They owned at Intel. Maybe sprinkled in a little pets.com, right? That's my favorite one from the late 90s. <laughs> um, but you're seeing it right now. We saw, we look at so many portfolios every month that everyone owns. Not only do they own lots of technology funds and lots of growth stock funds that have semiconductor stocks and you know Microsoft and the Mega Cap 7 and whatever, but they also own NVIDIA outright. They own Microsoft outright. They own Amazon outright. So it's just the overweight of the overweight again. And we've talked about this a lot, but you live by the sword, you die by the sword. You know, it kind of reminds me of when we started paying capital management back in 2008, right? Everybody thought we were crazy, right? The market's crashed. It's, uh, you know, the end of capitalism. You know, there's going to be all types of regulations. The economy's never going to recover. And we were screaming from the mountaintop. There was a generational low and one of the greatest buying opportunities in the history of the U.S. stock market. Well, you know, people were way underweighted. U.S. stock market in 2008. Now we're streaming from the top of the mountaintop saying, you know, we have an unbelievable once in a lifetime opportunity to diversify away from large growth in the U.S. economy, right? And there's so many other great buying opportunities. And I think that, uh, you know, it's going to be an opportunity that's going to be chased. Remember, we, we've been talking a lot about the last couple of months of how investors don't invest for a bull market, they chase a bull market. Well, we're in a big, boomy bull market in our portfolio. And you know what? Chase is on, buddy. There's six trillion sitting on the sidelines, licking their chops. I'm ready for them to come in, help us out, get these portfolios to even a new all-time high. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 156, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. This is what Bob and I have been doing for a collective 75 years. But if you want a more hands-on approach, 
you want a second opinion on your portfolio and you've saved over a million dollars and you want to make sure your financial independence plan is on track, you can simply go to www.pmcm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review where we literally look at everything. There's not a firm out there that will do this work up front. We build you your own personalized financial portal. We give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life and hone in on every financial issue you need to address today, whether it's that income plan for retirement. How do you take Social Security? How do you factor in inflation? We will build you a dynamic income plan, show you how to draw from your portfolio so you don't run out of money. We'll look at diversification. Markets have been all over the place the last two years. Has your portfolio been like a yo-yo too? Or have you been sitting in cash? Paralysis by analysis, can't figure out what to do. We put together a full investment game plan. We tie it to your goals. We show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products like annuities, mutual funds, brokerage products, structured products. We do a deep dive of every investment you own. We show you how to reduce the cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. You get a full tax playbook. Literally go to www.pncm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E, having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And, you know, Jen, we figured we'd have you on the show since uh, no one knows renovation better than you, given the fact that you uh, hmm. just renovated your, your condo in Miami. I've seen it. I've seen the amazing work uh, that you've done down there. But I thought, you know, it would be good to just talk about some of the parallels between financial planning and what it's like renovating an apartment and, you know, one of the big things is getting contractors, which I know you had a lot of fun working with contractors. <laughs> yes, I did. Um, yeah. So when I was, I mean, it's my first renovation. So I was definitely a newbie in that sense. And I interviewed a lot of contractors and asked them a lot of the hard questions like, you know, what are the hidden fees? What, how do you get paid? How does this whole thing work? Um, and I had, you know, I asked my friends what were their, you know, thoughts because they've all been through renovations themselves. And I think one of the things I found was, you know, you really want to find someone that you can trust and have, you know, and has a lot of good references um, because you're going to be talking to this person a lot. So. It's kind of like funny. Yeah, exactly. When you when you finally decide to work with a financial professional, that's the thing. It's a very personal relationship and you're going to work with that person a lot. So if you don't like that person, and I think one of the biggest problems in our industry is, how condescending and, uh, uh, you know, basically like the know-it-alls that are in our business that don't explain things well. And, and you're right, like, you know, it, it does bode well to find someone who has had a good experience already. Um, if you have a friend or somebody who works with somebody and can say, hey, this person does a really good job. Exactly. And I think, you know, and I, I as a financial advisor, I'm very, you know, keen on educating my clients and they were the same way and saying, you know, if I didn't understand what this invoice was or what they were talking about, some plumbing issue, whatever it is, they were there to sit down and they really explained it to me, which I found super helpful. And, and I think that is, that is, that is definitely the biggest, one of the biggest culprits in our business is, you know, Bob, you have a, you have a saying, um, know what you own and why you own it. And how many of us have like just like a collection of investments right. where we're probably sold a lot of products and we have no idea why we own them. We have no idea how it's correlated to our goals. But our industry is infamous for that. Yeah, I know. The contractors are too. I mean, it's like when you, uh, you you talk to your contractor and they get friendly with it. They say, well, you know, well, I was thinking maybe we should do this. And they say, oh, yeah, that's fine. Just, it's just going to cost a little bit more. But then they don't ever articulate the price, right? They just, it's <laughs> you know, you get that sticker shock at the end. And I think it's a lot with these some of these uh, products that are pitched to people is they, they talk about the benefits um, of the investment, but they don't talk about the cost. You really have to do your... You know, you have to do your own little digging, you know, to find out what the costs are. Um, you know, like Aaron, Aaron's uh, neighbor got pitched on this investment uh, that had about a 16% return. <laughs> and, you know, that doesn't set off, you know, uh, alarms right away. And then you just get the risks list and the, and the cost list. You're like, wow, you know, look at all the costs to get this 16% return. I don't think you're going to get it. Reminds me of an annuity, right? Yeah, it's just great benefits, but uh, there's no fees, I promise you. And there's lots of fees. And I'm sure you find that too with the contractor. It's like, you think you're coming in for one price, but by the time you're done, it's a much higher price than you first anticipated. Yeah. And I think one of the other sort of 
you know, pain points of, of contracting and financial planning in general is, you know, planning for the unexpected, right? So having that extra bucket of, you know, hey, what if something happens? What if you're delayed? What if, you know, you have, I need a new roof, whatever that thing is that you have that extra cash component. And also like, where are you going to pull that from? Do you have the assets available? Can you take a loan for your 401k? Can you take a loan from your home? Can you do a home equity? So there's all those options to look at, especially even before you get started. It's such, such a great point. I mean, risk management is like everything, right? And we see that right now. We've talked about this earlier on the show, but like so many investors right now have all their money in tech, in growth, NVIDIA, you know, all, all the stocks that have been really hot. But what happens if all the stocks aren't doing well anymore? And that's where your whole portfolio is. And now you have to draw from your portfolio. And I think a lot of you know, pre-retirees or retired now have that risk in their portfolio where if things don't go well, are you protected? I would argue most of you probably are. You know, and then the other thing is, is when, when you go through a renovation, um, it's pretty exciting, especially when they're, they're finished. But, um, but then, you know, you get the stress test, right, of living there. And then you start to pick out the little flaws, little shortcuts they took. Um, and it's really hard to get them back to fix it, you know. And, and, and I think that's what the, the lesson you learn in your, in your portfolio strategy is, you know, you, you really want to do a stress test before, you know, you put your money into a strategy. Because if you wait until it gets stressed in real-time analysis, right, and you're living through it, uh, it's sometimes too late, right, because you have a loss of principle. Where you miss an opportunity. That's annoying. <laughs> That's really yeah. annoying. Um, no, but it's a great point. Right? We, we talk about bulletproofing your portfolio because you don't know what you don't know. And you know the question is like, what happens if interest rates keep going higher here like they are right now? We learned a lot two years ago that your bonds go down and a lot of us own bond funds and they got destroyed when, the, when interest rates went up. Um, you know, The other question is like, what happens if inflation you know, continues to go higher every year? Have you factored that into your lifestyle, what you're going to need? Because, I mean, the bottom line is just based on historical averages, whatever you need today to spend over 20 years is going to be double because inflation's going higher. And have you accounted for that in your portfolio? One of my biggest pet peeves is these annuities always pitch income for life. But the problem is it's the same amount of income every year, yet your expenses are going higher. So how does that work? The math on that doesn't work at all. It's a big problem. And I think that's where a lot of the projections that you run uh, are typically not sufficient to to factor in all the things that can go wrong. But a lot can go yeah. wrong in home renovation. Well, <laughs> well, I'll tell you the big problem is when you hire the wrong people, right? That you know, you're someone who's got expertise in in wiring and, and electrical wiring, and then they profess that they're also an expert in plumbing, carpentry, finished carpentry, <laughs> tackling, you know, painting, um, and you say, well, you know, I thought you were an expert in this. Yeah, well, I did it once. Uh, yeah. and you know, you, did, you have to make sure that they do have the expertise that they profess they have. And I see that a lot with folks in our industry, um, especially as, you know, people hang out shingles and professing to be certified financial planners, not certified, but financial planners, you know, like an accountant who suddenly wants to manage money. Um, it, it's just, it, it, you know, you can't have a jack of all trades, you know, professing to do extraordinary things when they're just an ordinary person. Exactly. And I think you really want to find someone who can specialize in what you want, right? And for me, I wanted someone who, cause I knew what I wanted my life and my home to look like. And, you know, somebody who can see what, you know, my vision was. And same thing about what we do, right? I mean, we want to, like with our clients, say, you know, hey, what do you want your life to look like? And let's make sure we can make that happen. Yes. It's like, don't put the car for the horse. Tell us all the time. You've got to put the vision in place first. I like using vision. It's nicer than goals. So you have to really look at, okay, what am I going to spend? What do I want to do with my life? Then reverse engineer that. Then you build the portfolio around that. Like imagine just going in and haphazardly just decorating your apartment with no vision to what it's supposed to look like. You know, it's going to look like one of those antique garages. <laughs> it's Actually, not going to look very good. You know, you just saying that. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's also, yeah. I think, important to have, you know, a contractor with experience, right? To have a little bit of gray hair, a little scar tissue in their stomach lying. So when you say, hey, I really want to, I want to do this. And they say, well, here's why that doesn't work. Um, and here's why, you know, it, you're going to run into issues. I mean, sometimes when an architect draws something up, it looks beautiful, but it's unrealistic. It can't be built, right? And, and, and you, have, you, know, you have to have a contractor that knows that when they're looking at plans that know it's not feasible. Um, you know, same thing with our clients. We have to know when to tell them no, you know, um, you know, have that experience of, no, you don't put all your money 
into the queues. Uh, you don't put it all in the S&P 500. Here's why, right? And, you know, and when you start to get this response from your client is, oh, I didn't know that. That's when you know you've earned your keep. Yeah, tough love, right? You need someone who's going to give you tough love and tell you, not just enable you with your, uh, yeah, to left your own devices, but you need to know when, when things aren't going right or things need to be fixed. And I will say that like, there's nothing more dangerous than a CPA that has a shingle to, to do investments. Like, you don't want me doing your taxes, trust me. Um, and, and I think that's really important, especially as you're getting close to retirement or even when you're younger, it's just like have that financial dream team, right? Have someone who does handle the investments, handles the financial planning, but work with the best estate planner, work with the best tax advisor. That's how we do it for our clients. So you have that dream team of experts that work together to give that holistic approach. It's the same thing as having like your contractor who subs out to the best people so you get that whole holistic solution when it comes to putting it together, right? The more you have a, an overall vision and you have everyone working towards that vision, the higher success you're going to have, whether it's your home renovation or it's your financial plan. All right, it's the Hidden Facts of Finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob. Private equity firms are sitting on a record $3.2 trillion of unsold investments in 28,000 companies, according to a March 11 article in Private Equity News. The average holding period for buyouts among U.S. and Canadian private equity funds hit 7.1 years in November of last year, the longest holding period since 2000, according to a November 22 S&P Global report. The period is up from an average of 5.8 years from 2014 to 2023, and more like five years over the last decade. So basically, you have to sit on that illiquid money a lot longer. Is private equity really a good deal? Well, you know, I love private equity. They take a publicly traded company most most times that you can sell at any point in your in, in your holding period, and then they slap a bunch of fees on it, restructure it, and then try and sell it back to you uh, at a much higher price. Unfortunately, it looks like these things are turning into the Hotel California of investing, right? You can check in, but you can never check out. <laughs> um, so we, we tend to avoid these illiquid uh, great ideas. Another, another great idea from Wall Street where uh, ordinary people keep promising me they can do extraordinary things. And Bob, I just love the fact that you took a private equity investment and you were able to uh, make a metaphor with an eagle song. Amazing. Um, but yeah, you're right. And so much of this stuff is sold. I have so many clients getting pitched a lot of these deals and they're high in fees. They're illiquid, they're leveraged and they don't price every day. Buyer beware. Jen, according to a March 21st society general note, the S and P 500 index would be trading 700 points lower without the artificial intelligence boom. What's more excluding the earnings of NASDAQ hundred companies from the S and P 500 would have resulted in profits falling for two consecutive years. Man, oh man, tech and AI have basically driven everything for the last year or so. It's pretty crazy, actually. And even, you know, there's just so much unknown in that sector at this point that it's such a question mark still, right? I mean, we have I have questions all the time from clients. Like, Do we have AI? Do we have these things? Of course, we have a little bit of it, but to make it a big chunk of your portfolio is so risky. It is. It had a hot run, but as Bob, you, you were saying earlier, it's just like, can it keep up the, the performance? Odds are probably not that good. Yeah, but I can guarantee you one thing. Uh, earnings season is starting up again, right? We're now in April. So we're, we're going into earnings season again, even though it seems like we just finished the first quarter. Um, I guarantee you on every conference call, artificial intelligence will be mentioned. <laughs> no matter what you do, no matter what company, no matter what industry, it will be mentioned. We're, we're emphasis on the artificial, not the intelligence here at Payne Capital Management. <laughs> Bad joke. Lots of intelligence. Um, Jen, thanks for joining the show today. Thanks, guys. Hope you enjoyed episode 156, Pain Points of Wealth. If you like our podcast, love our podcast, give us that five-star ratings on Apple. If this is on Spotify, you can subscribe. You can give us a rating there as well. If this is on YouTube. You can like this episode. You can subscribe. Click that notification bell to be updated every week of our new content. Your support and enthusiasm for our podcast continues to allow us to do this podcast. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind. Thanks for listening to The Pain Points of Wealth. Hopefully you found the ideas discussed in this episode valuable and useful for your own financial journey. 
You can find out more about Bob, Ryan, and Chris's firm, Payne Capital Management, at BeBullish.com or through the contact information found in the description of this episode in your podcast player or app. Join us next week for another episode of The Pain Points of Wealth, brought to you by Payne Capital Management. Information provided on today's show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Investment is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed. 